about three months ago, three or four months ago, the famous actor Robin Williams committed suicide. And most likely, the reason why he committed suicide was because he thought that life is actually worse than death. And that the pain of life can be relieved by dying. And so he took his own life. And that would be the state of affairs or the mentality, the mindset of anybody who personally kills himself. And a number of people do that. As a matter of fact, in Korea, we have the worst teenage suicide in the world. Because there's way too much pressure of performance. So they can't take it, and they release their actions or their emotions through all kinds of channels, including alcohol, drugs, video games. And they have become slaves to something else because of the pressure. But the problem with that mentality is, if they are not believers, their end is going to be worse than what they were running away from. See, because nothing can be compared to the tragedy and the pain of hell. So for Robin Williams, who was not a believer, not that I know of, he escaped one pain in order to face even a greater pain. And what's even worse than that is he can never undo his actions and come back and change his mind. It's permanent. What I want to share with you this morning is that when we read this passage, it is disturbing, but in a greater way. It's worse than Robin Williams' situation because Jesus rejected what seemed to be his people. I don't know what Christianity you're practicing and whether your Christianity is going to be accepted before Jesus. And if you stood in front of Jesus, would Jesus say, come in or get out? Before you confidently answer this question, let's see what went wrong with these people. And let's learn from what Jesus told them. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, unless we unpack this text, we won't really appreciate the magnitude of what Jesus is saying and what the people experienced. Because there was a great assumption in the people's mindset that we need to learn from. Well, first of all, it says, don't and from the text, we can say, don't count on going to heaven because you say the right things. <laughs> don't count on going to heaven because you say the right things. Now, when I was nine years old and came to the United States, the children around the neighborhood were very cruel. Neighborhood and school. Because... I was a brand new item for them. They, they've never seen an Asian before. So, you know, whatever references they had in order to evaluate me was completely ignorant. So they said, hey, Chinese, and I said, no. They said, hey, Japanese, I said, no. 
And then they said, then what are you? Because they had no idea that there was a third one. <laughs> they only knew Chinese and Japanese. I said, I'm Korean. And they said, what's that? <laughs> so, the kids made fun of me, but I want to talk to you about not Chinese, not Japanese, but Christianese. You speak Chinese if you're Chinese, you speak Japanese if you're Japanese, you speak Christianese if you're a Christian, or so-called Christian. You know, I'm saved, and the Baptists like to say, and by the blood of the Lamb. I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. I'm justified, sanctified, glorified. Circumcised. I have Jesus in my heart. We live by faith and not by sight. Jesus is the reason for the season. <laughs> Pray about it. Give it to the Lord. And we speak Christianese fluently. As a matter of fact, if you're not sensitive to Christianese, you'll run into people like this. So, in the Bible Belt in South Carolina, North Carolina, they have billboards all over the place advertising the gospel. And, you know, in big two words, it says, Jesus saves. And the non-Christians are driving by and looking at the sign and asking, asking themselves, I wonder what bank he uses. <laughs> they have no idea what save means. So, when we use Christianese, then... We speak an entirely different language. But just because you speak the language doesn't mean that you are a Christian or that Jesus will, will accept you. Calling Jesus by his title doesn't get you there either because they called him Lord, Lord. Anybody can use a title. But if you call Obama Mr. President, you're not getting into the White House. Just because you use the title doesn't mean that you have the relationship. Just because you call me dad doesn't make me your father. Just because they called him Lord, Lord didn't mean that they have a relationship with Jesus. A woman walks onto the football field and calls out, Hey coach, why don't you put my son in the game? Is she calling him coach because the coach is her coach? No, that's his title. The relationship between a coach and a player is for the players on the field. But the woman called the coach coach because that's his title. So just because you call Jesus Lord and that's his title doesn't mean that you have a relationship with him. This is what the people were assuming. I call him Lord and therefore I have a relationship with him. So here the text is saying that just because you say the right things doesn't mean that you have a relationship with Jesus. Neither does doing the right thing, it says. It says, don't count on going to heaven because you do the right things, either in verse 22. Verse 22 says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, they will not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Cool. No, just because you do the right, or are doing the right things, seemingly, doesn't mean that you have a relationship with the Lord. Many, it says, will claim great deeds, prophesying, exorcisms, miracles, all done in Jesus' name. And Jesus tells them, you still miss the point. So we begin to wonder here if our foundation is off. See, I can understand deceiving or patronizing words, but actions speak much louder than words, don't they? I mean, 
You can claim to be a Christian, but if you don't act like one, what point is there? These guys certainly acted like it. Why would Jesus reject these people who seemingly serve him? So if someone, someone says to me, or we say this to each other, I never miss a Sunday service. I pay attention. I listen to the word of God when it's spoken. I sing in the choir. I get involved in the church. I cut Sunday school. I was an usher, a greeter, an AV guy. I went on mission trips during the summer and during my time off in school. I share my faith. I read and study my Bible. I tithe. I invite people to church. I was a deacon. I was an elder. I was a pastor. See, all of those things that I mentioned, that's what we normally practice, right? That's what we normally practice. This is what we do. This is how we get involved in the church. But that's not what they're claiming. See? They're claiming what I label as above average Christianity. See? They say that they did miracles. They say they prophesied. They say they casted out demons. When was the last time you prophesied, last time you did a miracle, and last time you casted out a demon? See? Now, look, listen to me. If you compare your life to these people and say, they did that, I didn't do it, they're much more worthy than I am to go to heaven. So if they don't get in, then how am I supposed to have hope that I would get in? Is Jesus going to stand there and say, I never knew you. But wait a minute, I went to church and I sang in the choir. I went on the mission trips. Come on, I tied, read your Bible. And Jesus still tells you no. Then what are you going to say? You're my Lord though. I accepted you as my Lord and Savior. And if he says, I never knew you, what are you going to do? See, if you assume that you are a believer and you died and you went to heaven and Jesus reject, rejected you, that would be the most tragic thing in your life. And here these people are examples of what Jesus is going to say to people who have done extraordinary things, so it seems. They still didn't make it. And I hope that you are concerned about your relationship and your position with the Lord right about now. Because I don't want you to go through life thinking, oh, death is going to be better for me because I'm going to heaven. And then you get there and you get hugely and utterly disappointed because you face the same words that Jesus gave these people. So if it isn't what we say or do, how is entrance into heaven determined? See? So outside of Christianity and inside, we say that Christianity is about do's and don'ts. We do good and not do evil. And that's partially true. I mean, what good is it if God's people are not living a righteous life? But it's more than this because Jesus gives us a hint of what he is looking for. Because he says clearly why they were rejected. And they were rejected because he said, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. And then he tells them, away from me, you evil doers. See, that's the strangest thing. But first, let's unpack the first part. He says, I never knew you. So, whatever it is, his acceptance of us is based on his knowledge of us? Factual? No. It's not a factual knowledge. What he is talking about here is experiential knowledge. Know us. This is the same no, like we have one word for no. 
And it could mean two things, factual or intimate. Well, Greek has two words for factual and intimate. They separate them. This word right here is intimate knowledge. Okay? Let me explain. Excuse me. Uh, when the angel came to Mary and announced that she was going to have a child, Mary was perplexed. Her response was, how can I be pregnant? I've never known a man. And what she meant, of course, is, I never had intimacy with a man. That this is the no. This is the word. And Jesus said, I was never in a relationship with you. And you were never in a relationship with me. But how did they do all those things? How did they prophesy? How did they drive out demons? How did they do all these miracles? The Bible does not answer the question. We don't know how they did it. All we know is the reality that just because you thought you did it, doesn't mean you have a relationship with the Lord. If you have a relationship with the Lord, you will certainly go to heaven. If you don't, you won't. Now you have to have a big test. You have to research now. You have to personally soul search and seek, study the scriptures to see if you really do have a relationship with the Lord, if He actually does know you. Why does the Lord, however, call them evildoers for prophesying, for driving out demons, and performing many miracles? That's just like saying, oh, you went on the mission trip? You foul human being. You study your Bible? Man, that's just heinous. You go to church and give tithe? You're, you're satanic. Here, Jesus is saying he did all those things, or they said that we did all these things, but he still calls them evildoers. Why would Jesus call people evildoers when they did all these things seemingly for him? If I give my money to the poor, volunteer at the soup kitchen, and try to be a good neighbor and citizen, would Jesus call me evil? <coughs> Apparently, it depends. It depends. <coughs> One of the things that is really wrong with this interaction, and you have to, you have to think outside the box. And the outside of the box is, here we have to analyze the text and see what's not there. So when you study the Bible, do you study the Bible to see what's not there? I mean, yes, we're supposed to study the Bible to see what's there, but you also have to study the Bible to see what's not there. Okay? What's not there? Well, the cross is not there. Their relationship with Jesus is not there. They don't tell Jesus it's because of you, right? It's because of you that I can come into your kingdom. They don't say, you get all the credit. No, they say, did we not prophesy? Did we not drive out demons, and then we not perform many miracles. Okay? Now, before you think that they did something wrong, listen to this. Okay? What does James say? Faith without works is dead. Okay? So if you tell me you're a Christian, and you're not following the Lord, you're not being obedient to Him, you, you don't walk with Him, you don't interact with Him, I will go, you got a dead Christianity, you got a dead faith. James says, Faith without works is dead. So, if you have a dead faith, you can claim all you want, but if you're not following Him, if you're not being obedient to Him, you have a dead faith. So, what do you do? You say, okay, I don't want a dead faith. I'm going to serve. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to walk with the Lord. I'm going to do all these Christian things, and I'm going to show you my faith. And then you should be able to have confidence 
Hey Lord, I know that you don't accept dead faith. And here are the reasons why my faith is alive. I did all of these things. Wouldn't you have confidence then? Should you not have confidence then? Absolutely. But they did that and they, Jesus still rejected them. They said, let, let me show you what I did with my faith. This is what we did. We not prophesy and in your name drive out demons and perform any miracles. So these are the reasons why you can say that I have faith because I put it into practice. But Jesus said no. He said no. I have six children. I told you that. And my desire for my kids is for them to excel. So I have goals for them. You know? I have goals for them. And my goals are they speak a foreign language, get a master's degree, and play a musical instrument. Only one plays a musical instrument, my father. Simeon is going to graduate this year, and I don't know what he's going to do. He can do whatever he wants because he's an adult. Okay. But if they did that, and because, uh, and, and because I will eventually be a famous pastor someday, I have a lot of money, and I'm going to give them a, and here's my promise, if you do all these things, I'm going to give you a sports car, a house uh, as a wedding present, and $100,000 in cash to spend however you want. Would that be great? Yeah. Okay? So, let's say Simon goes to Spain, and he, he's, uh, he's finishing up his master's degree in in Spanish history, he plays the violin, and uh, and so he he's fulfilling the requirements. And while he's there, he strikes up a friendship and makes several friends. And one of them, uh, he he shares this thing because he asks, "Hey, Simeon, why are you here? Well, I'm getting a master's degree, and my dad said that if I get a master's degree, play a musical instrument, and speak a foreign language, then I would uh, get this, this, and this." And he goes, "Really?" What? A sports car, a house, and a hundred thousand dollars? That's amazing. He said, yup. Yeah. Well, sometime later, somebody rings my doorbell. So I go there, and it's Jose. Jose, my my son's friend, who heard about all this. And he says, Let me tell you, English is my second language. I play the piano. <laughs> And I just graduated with a master's degree in finance. And I tell him, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. What has that got to do with me? He goes, well, your son told me that when, when I had those things, I would get a sports car, a uh, house at, at my wedding, and $100,000 in cash. And he goes, that, that's what I'm here for. And I said, you're right. It is the reward. But that's not for you. It's for my son and my daughter. My kids. But I did those. I fulfilled the requirement of the foreign language, a master's degree, and a musical instrument. And I tell them again, look, I'm glad that you are making progress and you have ambitions, but you don't get my reward. These are for my kids. Look, and then he turns, and let's say he starts getting angry. Let's say he starts being demanding. Dang it, I fulfilled the requirement. I demand $100,000, and I'm getting married soon, so I, I want a house, and the sports car would be great. And I say, young man, you're beginning to disturb me. <laughs> you're getting on my nerves. Okay? And if he keeps demanding, what am I going to do? I'm going to call the police and have him called away. Why? Because he's demanding something that doesn't belong to him. Okay? But imagine the other way. Let's say Simeon comes back early. He rings the doorbell because he wants to surprise me. He rings the doorbell. I open up. I say, son, what are you doing here? Did you get thrown out? No, Dad, I finished early and I thought I'd surprise you. So I hug him and he immediately comes in the house and we catch up. Okay? 
Well, he didn't have to stand in front of the door and go, this is what I did, and this is why I'm worthy, and I came for the reward. Does he have to do that? No. I recognize him from 10 miles away because he's my son. He doesn't have to justify himself. He doesn't have to show me his credentials. He doesn't have to tell me what he did, what he didn't do. We have a relationship with him, so I bring him in immediately. Here, the problem with these people is that they're trying to pull out their credentials and say, this is why I'm worthy. As soon as they do that, they disqualify themselves. As soon as they say, this is what I did, this is what I did for you, they disqualify themselves immediately. No need for further conversation. You're out. Does Jesus argue with them and say, you didn't prophesy. That was phony. You, you didn't do any miracles. That was phony. You didn't drive out any demons. That was a figment of your imagination. Did Jesus argue with them about what they did? That it never came true? No. He didn't argue with them because that was not the point. The point is the fact that you call this out and you're trying to bring credentials on me means that you and I don't have a relationship. As a matter of fact, because you're demanding what belongs to my kids, you are evil. That's just like trying to take my son's little giraffe. <laughs> if somebody came and said, hey, you know, I've been really, really well behaved. And uh, I want that, and he takes it. I said, what? <laughs> that belongs to my Moses, my Moselicious. <laughs> you can't take that. And I will call that person a thief. So if these people are trying to get what doesn't belong to them, then of course they're evil. Jesus calls them evildoers because they're trying to be thieves. And Jesus cast them out. We can't determine the relationship by our obedience. We can only show it. Relationship determines the obedience. See, obedience can't determine the relationship. If I obey my boss, doesn't mean that he's my father. If I obey the president, doesn't mean that he's my father. If you know one of you obeys me, that doesn't mean that we're related. But if we're related, my children better obey me. Because I'll bring out the stick. So because of the relationship we obey, not for the sake of relationship, Keith Green was like the number one, the forerunner of the contemporary Christian music um, phenomenon. Okay? Forerunner. His concerts were free. Okay? His concerts were free. Nobody does that anymore. Why? Because they're all about making money, even Christians. But his concerts were all free. He just took a, an offering. Okay? And this is what he said. Look, saying a prayer, going to church, all of that stuff, all of these ministries, doing all of those things don't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. <laughs> That's what he said. But if you're a Christian... You should be serving and being obedient to the Father. But you never bring your actions up as something that you put forth as the reason why you are worthy. No. So, how is it that we actually get to heaven? See, we say this, and, and I want to correct it. Jesus didn't say... Enter into heaven, city. No, he didn't. He said the kingdom of heaven. And there's a big difference. 